How do you begin to talk to people about Jesus if they reject the Bible, or if they're just not comfortable starting with the Bible? Well, that is what we're going to talk about today on our show, why Jesus still matters in a world that rejects the Bible. Now, if we're just meeting, I'm your apologetics guy, Mikel Del Rosario, and this channel is all about helping you explain your faith with courage and compassion. One of the new things I'm doing is interviewing experts who can help us think through creative ways to do just that, so please consider subscribing. A little backstory before I introduce our guest today is over the last four years, I wrote my PhD dissertation, which approaches Jesus uh, through the lens of a historian, and I wrote that for an academic audience. But our guest on the show today spent the last four years writing a book that anyone can get that approaches Jesus through the lens of a detective. My guest coming to us via Zoom is Jay Warner Wallace. Jim has been called America's foremost cold case detective, the evidence whisperer, and you might have seen him on Dateline or in the movie God's Not Dead 2. He is also an adjunct professor of apologetics at Biola University, my alma mater. Welcome, Jim. Thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. Well, Jim, you recently put out a book called Person of Interest, and yeah. the subtitle is why Jesus still matters in a world that rejects the Bible. Now, the title person of interest uh, is a term many of us have heard maybe on cop shows or on true crime sure. podcasts. Uh, tell us, why did you choose that title? Well, a lot of it was, as you know, I'm, I'm going, like you said, I'm always writing things from the perspective of a detective. So that's something that I'm always interested in. And I, I, when I first became a Christian, I became a Christian by examining the evidence, not to say that, of course, God wasn't working in my life or that the spirit of God wasn't the, the, the thing that was calling me. Of course it was, but he calls each of us in a slightly different way, right? Sometimes based on our experiences, based on the languages that we use, the vocabulary that we use. And in my vocabulary back in those days was... In, entirely investigations, investigations mm -hmm. and investigations. So a lot of what I did was examine the scriptures as though they were, you know, how would you, if they really truly are eyewitness accounts, then I ought to be able to test them as though they are eyewitness accounts. Mm -hmm. But my problem was I wasn't really interested in scripture. And I thought everyone's got their crazy scripture and I'm just not interested in yours or anybody else's. But I was interested, at least initially, in Jesus as an interesting person. Mm -hmm. now, that is definitely a term that we use. Uh, not, I, you know, most of my career, that term was not in use. I think it kind of pops into the vocabulary once um, some of the terrorist activity is being investigated by the federal agencies. But, but typically, when it is used today, it's it's used to say to to, uh, to kind of demark either people who are potential suspects when we don't quite have enough evidence to file a case yet. So we would say, well, they're not really suspects or defendants. They are just persons of interest. Or you might use it because you don't have anybody uh, as a potential suspect. You don't even know where to look yet. But you do know there's a witness out there that you've been told about that might be able to give you a lead. So that person is a person of interest, even though that person is not necessarily a suspect in the case. So those are why how the terms are typically used. But for me, I use this term for Jesus because... When I first walked into an evangelical church with my wife, I had never been in one for anything other than like a wedding. Mm -hmm. And so I walked into this church. The pastor seemed uh, strangely ordinary, mm -hmm. uh, just like a regular guy wearing regular clothes. And uh, he said that Jesus was the smartest man who ever lived. Mm -hmm. And that struck me as worth, in, for selfish reasons, uh, as worth investigating, right? Like if I could steal the wisdom of Jesus, it might help me in my career. It might help me in my interactions with other people. It might even help me in my interviews. <laughs> so I was willing to look at Jesus as a smart guy, somebody who was interesting. Um, but that was it. And by the way, in my view, Jesus did not have to be a true historical figure to, to, to provide some wisdom. I mean, how many times have you ever seen a meme or heard someone quote Luke Skywalker or, mm -hmm. or a, a Jedi master or, you know, what? yeah, these are fictional characters. I mean, yeah. you can, if, if you've got a good writer, the fictional character can still say Sherlock Holmes says lots of smart things, but out of the, and he's not a real character, right? So, so you could learn something from fiction and that's how I first saw it. Uh, and it really was examining the case for Christianity that, that changed my mind. Hmm. Wow. Well, the way people start looking into Jesus is often a very personal thing, and you've applied your background in solving uh, cold case homicides to your personal investigation. Right. Um, the first chapter of your book is called The Fuse and the Fallout, Jesus Without the New Testament. I got this lovely pack from the uh, publisher, 
and it has these awesome yes, drawings right. on it, which you actually did. Is that not right? Yeah. So, you know, my background before I became a detective, I was an architect and I was, um, I had my bachelor's degree in design design and my master's degree was in architecture and I call it architecture torture. Uh, <laughs> then I went, became a police officer and uh, ultimately I always felt like that creative itch was hard to scratch in mm. the kinds of things I was doing as a police officer. But by the time I started investigations, I realized that a lot of what I was doing was quite creative, not maybe visually creative, but it was creative in its approach. And then I realized that I could use the visual arts to help um, make broader concepts accessible mm. to juries. Uh, you're kind of telling parables, you know, this is to this as this is to that. And so you do this with juries all the time and it helps them to see, yeah, okay, I get it. The fuse and the fallout, for example, is one such visual parable, mm -hmm. right? You were saying, hey, uh, I work cases where a woman disappears because her husband killed her mm -hmm. and, and then claimed that she ran off of her own free will. I had a case where I think about 30 years went by. Yeah, about 30 years from the time she went missing. Mm -hmm. We did not investigate the case as a murder for the first six years. Wow. She had, he had so utterly convinced everyone involved that she had run off hmm. that, that they were convinced of it. So, but when I opened the case 30 years ago, our agency had never received a single phone call from the victim's family in which they're saying, Hey, is anyone working this case? She's been gone for 30 years. No, they would prefer to have thought that their daughter was alive and had just left. Then was killed by the husband who has now become like a son to them. They, they did not want to believe it. Well, what do you do in a case like that? I've got no crime scene. I've got no body. I've mm -hmm. never discovered the body. Uh, no one ever took a pictures of the crime scene as if it was a murder scene. They believed it was a missing person. So no one even went in the house. Well, now what do I do? No evidence in a crime scene, no evidence, no physical evidence, no body. You know, mm -hmm. I'm trying to make a case in front of a jury. Well, what I tell them is that all crimes are part of a timeline. On the day that she disappeared, if it's a murder, it's like a bomb went off. And that explosive event was preceded by a fuse that burned slowly until the detonation of the bomb. Once the bomb explodes, you've got shrapnel and debris all over the crime scene. So what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, is we're going to show you from just the fuse and the fallout Hmm. exactly what happened on the day she vanished. And in the end, fuses and fallouts usually point to somebody as a suspect. And now what I was thinking about when it comes to Christianity, if you're not interested in scripture, mm -hmm. you're like thinking, I don't care about your stupid Bible. I don't even want to read it. It's all, I've tried to read it. It's boring, whatever you say. I mean, how many times have you heard this where people are skeptical? That was yeah. my words for a lot of years. Hmm. Well, then how could you discover what is true about Jesus? Well, it turns out there's enough information in the fuse and fallout of history mm -hmm. to reconstruct the Jesus story in its entirety. And the impact that Jesus has in the fallout of history demonstrates more than his historicity. I think it actually demonstrates his deity. Wow. What's interesting too for me is, uh, you know, doing my historical study as a, a PhD student and finishing up my dissertation, we study surviving traces of past events. And that's, that's right. very similar to what you've done. But in your book, you don't only go to traces of past events in, you know, in quote unquote history, but even in the modern times and how that's Jesus right. impacts the world. Um, tell us a little bit about these fuses because you mentioned uh, there's more than one. Yeah, there's three strands that I track. You could probably trace more, but I'm looking for things that I can actually put dates to on the timeline, okay. not, not kind of generic, larger and broader concepts of history, but actually timelines I could trace, right? So, for example, you can trace the timeline of spirituality and the ways that mythologies are embraced by ancient cultures. You can kind of get a starting, rough starting time for each of these mythologies, a rough ending time for each of these mythologies. And what you'll see is if you read those mythologies is that mm. they all have some broad similarities, broad brush similarities, because the expectations of all of us as humans are pretty consistent over time when we start to think and imagine what God would be like. C.S. Lewis mm. describes these as the kinds of man's myths from the mm. minds of poets and thinkers, mm -hmm. given what evidence is available to them. Now, he uses the word myth not to mean um, a falsehood or a lie or a tall tale. He means it as 
as a description of deity or description of how deity mm-hmm. might enter into the world, how we get here, how God works in the world, these types of mythologies that yeah. he would describe man's mythologies. So I actually read all of those and I discovered about 15. You could probably stretch it to 18 or reduce it to 10, but about 15 that I saw repeatedly in the mythologies. And each ancient mythology would contain some combination, not always the same ones, of either six to 10 of these 15 broader expectations of humans. But it turns out that when Jesus arrives in the first century, he meets and actually possesses all 15 of the attributes, even though the ancients don't, no one gets more than 10. So what's interesting about that is that we, that Jesus seems to meet not just the prophecies of the Jews, that's another strand in the fuse, but he meets the expectations of what we would call pagans or non-Jews or non-Christians, right? People who believe in a God other than Yahweh. Well, they have expectations of God too. And Jesus actually most robustly meets those expectations. So this kind of old claim we've heard for years now that that Jesus is a copycat savior. Well, in Mm. some sense, you might be able to say he's definitely in a broad sense, So, for example, uh, one of the most common uh, iterations or imaginations of ancients about their gods is that they are going to enter into the world in a supernatural way, an unexpected, extra natural way. Okay, well, that's different depending on the god. Sometimes he emerges out of the side of a mountain, sometimes out of the thigh of another god. Sometimes, you know, there's lots of different crazy ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, it turns out that, that Jesus also enters the world in an unexpected, supernatural way. But wouldn't you expect that if there's a supernatural God, he would probably both enter and exit his realm supernaturally. That's a common expectation that we would all have. Well, Jesus meets those broad expectations, even if he does not meet them identically. Hmm. And this is why uh, to, to argue that somehow the first century writers trying to convince a Jewish audience of the Messiahship of Jesus of Nazareth would somehow steal and cobble together all of the ancient <laughs> expectations of pagans I think is a bit of a stretch. Yeah. On yeah. the other hand, it just makes sense that if God wants to enter into his creation, at that moment when the most worshiping people have the most common expectations of God, well, now you've got a, bro- a little a narrower uh, window opportunity mm-hmm. because you know these things, some of them stop being worshiped uh, earlier than other times in history. But it turns out Jesus falls right about in the middle of when all these mythologies, the most number of mythologies, are still actively being worshipped with certain expectations that Jesus happens to meet most robustly. So there is a timing about his arrival. I always say that if you want, when the expected meets the expectations of the expector, you get better results. This is true for everything. This is true in your marriage, too, by the way. This is true in every aspect of life. But it certainly could be true also of of God, is that Jesus meets the most active expectations of the ancients who are thinking hard about God. And this Mm -hmm. is why Paul says this, I think, on on Mars Hill in Acts 17. Mm -hmm. You know, you people are really religious. Like, you have a lot of ideas about God. I'm here to show you where you're right and where you're wrong. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think you see happening with uh, that's one of those fuses. The other third fuse I talk about in the book is the kind of cultural uh, empire changing fuse as one empire rises and falls leading up to the Roman Empire, which has this unifying ability and provides several key aspects of culture that favor the communication of anything that occurs in the first century of note. You have roads in place, you have postal services in place, you have transportation Mm -hmm. devices in place, you'll have a 200 year period of peace, you'll have a certain amount of religious tolerance that at least allows for the initiation of any structure to start. So there's some things that are in place from the the perspective of culture that also give you a window of opportunity during the Pax Romana, that 200 year period of peace, which by the way, helps because the roads that Paul was walking on to express the truth about Jesus were not available to him 200 years earlier uh, before their 200 year period of peace allowed the Roman empire to shift its resources from war games, from pursuing wars Mm -hmm. to creating the infrastructure for which they could prepare for the next war, which meant roads, roads that didn't turn too sharply because you have to move these war machines. You have to, you have to, you want, so that's why more bridges and tunnels are built in a Roman empire than another, because they're moving armies. 
without sharp turns. Well, those kinds of roads, you know, that expression, all roads lead to Rome, mm -hmm. was for the most part happening during this period of time. And guess what that favored? It favored the, uh, the um, transportation of ideas as well as mail and, and armies. Mm -hmm. And so the idea called Christianity has legs now in which you can walk. And that's what mm -hmm. happens in that first century. Wow. Yeah. In the missionary community, I used to be a missionary and uh, we would talk about what, you know, God has put eternity in their hearts, as we say. And that's, right. uh, that's what, just what you're talking about. And some of these pagan mythologies and parallels, there's so much parallel omania that goes on. It's like in a very yes. broad way, maybe, but yes. there, there's no way that the stories of these other pagan deities uh, was copied to make Jesus story. Paganism would not make Christianity more interesting or fun for Jewish people. Um, exactly. But I mean, can you imagine then that the, just the characteristics described by Matthew to or to a largely Jewish audience? I mean, mm -hmm. who uses more prophecy than Matthew in trying to make his case to his audience? And that's the audience that you expect then. I'm going to cobble together. You should recognize stories from Addis and from Heracles. And really? Now it turns <laughs> out many of these systems actually ended up bending and shaping themselves mm. after Jesus. Mm. In, the in the first, second, third, fourth century before they, they vanished off the off the map. So like Addis and Heracles and Mithras, many yes. of these that no longer are being worshipped, do adapt in some way. They are either modified, merged, or mentioned Jesus in some way. And that's part of the fallout we see. The fallout even affects other non-Christian religious worldviews. Mm -hmm. So I think that, yeah, and again, and in the end, we have to ask ourselves, you know, if you were to overlap, I do this in one of the chapters of the book. And I think when I first did this as a new investigator of these notions, like 25 years ago, when I first became a Christian, um, I, I, I always say I would have had a, people ask me, so which did you do first? I wrote a book called Cold Case Christianity. That looks at everything in the New Testament. This book does just the opposite. It looks at everything outside the New Testament. So the question that people ask, well, so which one of these did you do first? Mm -hmm. Well, to be honest, it was a terribly confusing and messy period of my life in which I was, this is true of all investigations, by the way, you, you might think, okay, I'm on my path. I've got a, a timeline. And then someone calls and says, Hey, so-and-so is in town. And they say they saw this thing over here. So now suddenly you've got a time sensitive witness. You're going to stop everything, grab a trail that for two weeks, work all those leads that are developed in two weeks. And then you come back to your case. Well, that was kind of me. 25 years ago, looking at the app, well, I would discover something and I would go, oh, and I would spend, you know, a week. And I will tell you, and Susie will tell you too, that I spent hours, I was working at a, a, what was called a four, 410, but it's more, more like in those days I was working undercover. So it was probably maybe like about 416, 16 hour shifts, but we were working them uh, only four days a week. So I had three days off every week. So I get up early morning every, every day. And before I go to work, I would be reading. I would sleep no more than six hours. I would never allow myself to sleep more than six hours because I wanted to study the case. Then I would get in a surveillance situation where I had time sometimes in my unit to just sit and read. And I had all these books. People thought I was crazy. My partners, I got an email last week from somebody who's, who, who wrote to me to say, hey, uh, I remember when you used to make fun of anything Jesus hmm. and I kind of wonder if God already had to kind of set you aside for this work because this is now, he's talking about 25 years ago. Uh, he knew me then and he was one of my training officers and he remembered as a, as a trainee, what, how I was anti-Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I'm surprised. I don't remember ever being, ever saying that out loud at that point in my career, but he remembered it. So they saw this chance for transformation. And so I, for me, I was doing this work. And back then I was low, I was identifying, wow, there's like a window of opportunity here in the first century. Mm -hmm. But I had what I would have called a blogger's sense of that. In other words, I'd find it in a book, but I'd kind of write it down on notes. I couldn't remember where I found it in the book then after that, right? Like it wasn't sourced. I just remember having read it <laughs> and I would kind of cobble this case together. Uh -huh. And, and I, but now writing this book, I knew I had to actually source these things. So I had to figure out which book did I get that from originally? You know, what's the source I used way back then? Uh -huh. And of course, things have been updated a lot since then. So now, I, I, as you see in that one chapter on the red zone, that area of opportunity in mm -hmm. which all three fuses overlap, mm -hmm. that's an area of about 100 years, 29 BC to about 70 AD, the destruction of the temple. It's in that range that all three of these fuses have a common window of opportunity. And it turns out that Jesus arrives right in the middle 30 years. You know, the middle 33 years are his. 
And uh, I thought that was kind of interesting that he mm-hmm. would happen to arrive at the fullness of time, yes. just when all of those fuses have burned and uh, provided an opportunity. Wow. Yeah, the fullness of time. That's another great, great concept. Think about the prophetic expectation. Um, you yeah. talked about two kinds of uh, prophecies. You kind of put them in a couple categories. You had clear yes. and cloaked. Explain yes. that to us. You know, a lot of that just came out of my own uh, sarcastic, arrogant um, skepticism. So, um, you know, the first like maybe eight months that I'm studying this, we were maybe if we weren't regular attenders to church, we were at least much more, you know, we were probably 60 percenters or something like that, where we would go to church a lot. I thought uh, probably not as much as, as, as others would think they should, mm-hmm. but for me, it was a lot. And so I'd be sitting in services and, and listening to this stuff from a very arrogant, skeptical perspective. Mm. And I remember uh, we had a guest speaker come into the church who was all hung up on prophecy. Now I get it. <laughs> I can, I can certainly understand the power of prophecy in my view was more skeptical. Because he would he would say, oh, there's like, I think he's over 300 prophecies, you know, yeah. that point to the Messiah. And he would like cite some of these. And so I would like look them up. And while we're sitting there, I, I'm always doing that. And I would show them to my wife. I'm like, first of all, I think it was hard to do that because I was not somebody who knew the Old Testament very well. Hmm. Like, where do I find this thing, right? I was relatively new at this. But I would okay. find it and I would read it and I would read the paragraph before it. And I'm like, this doesn't seem like he's even talking about a guy. Like this thing doesn't seem like it's talking about someone who's coming in the future to save the nation of Israel. It, it almost feels like this could be just David talking about David, or mm-hmm. this could be, you know, talking about something other than one single per. I mean, I just didn't buy it. I, I felt like if he's doing this for every one of these prophecies, I don't buy any of this prophecy stuff. Anyone can, you know, there's 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 lies and there's damned lies and there's statistics, right? Like there's those, this is like, do you think he's statistically uh, unlikely? I don't believe how you've shaped the statistic to begin with. So I was always very skeptical of prophecy and I was never impressed by it. And even when I wrote Cold Case Christianity, I never used prophecy as any kind of an indicator of whether or not any of this eyewitness claims were true. Mm-hmm. Not my thing. Now, interestingly, Looking back at it in hindsight, I have a different view. And that's what I wanted to share in this book. There's two different kinds of evidence at a crime scene. There's cloaked evidence and there's clear evidence. Clear evidence is the kind of thing that if you've got a good database, will identify your suspect before you ever meet him. So if you've got a good fingerprint database and you've got a fingerprint at a crime scene, well, guess what? It's going to tell me who did it. It's going to tell me probably where to find him. So I can knock on his door. I already know my suspect before I ever meet him because there was clear evidence. Some of our DNA databases are getting this good. So sometimes DNA can do this before that. It's clear. It points to what if you dropped your... Um, if you dropped your uh, your business card at a crime scene, I, I I had a case where somebody cut up the bodies of his victims and but left his identification information in the oh packaging. My. Oh my! So really, okay. So this is how people are. Some some of the stories will make you laugh. But the point is, that's clear. It, it points to somebody. Now, there's also sometimes like say a button or some other piece of debris, and you're kind of wondering. Is that even part of the crime? For all you know, that could have been laying there for a day before the crime ever occurred there. Mm -hmm. Is this, I don't see a button missing from the victim's shirt. Is that button from the suspect's shirt? Maybe, maybe not. I collect it. I photograph it anyway, not knowing if it has any evidential value. Now, if I meet this guy a year later and I do a search warrant on his house and I find he's got a shirt and all the buttons match this one, except for one that she appears to have replaced later. Well, okay. Now I can say this is a piece of cloaked evidence at the beginning, by the way, my dog Bailey is coming in here. <laughs> so you might see her in the background. Uh, but if, if, if I find something later that matches his shirt, although it wasn't clear to me in the beginning, it was even of ev- any evidential value. Mm-hmm. Well, now I know it's of evidential value and it helps me to make the case after I meet the suspect. So one of these clear evidence helps from the onset. One of these cloaked evidence helps in hindsight. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. so it turns out prophecies are very much the same way. Some are very clear and much more clear than others and, and really are considered to even be messianic prophecies by Jews today. They're that clear. But others are not. Others are the, and this is why I, you know, we've got a friend, a mutual friend who has got a large ministry here in Southern California. And one of his employees called me because he was deconstructing his faith. And one of the biggest problems he had was he felt like the New Testament authors had been, um, had kind of like unfairly used prophecy 
had used prophecy in a way that he didn't trust. Like mm-hmm. he said, I'm not even sure that prophecy was ever supposed to be messianic. Okay, he's talking about cloaked prophecies. Mm-hmm. But trust me, if you find a button and you're not sure if it is important, but it matches the button afterwards, you are going to mention it in your trial. You're going to mention it in your case. That's going to be considered evidence. Mm-hmm. So I think it's fair for the New Testament writers to look at prophecies that are like the button that match the shirt afterwards. Once we've identified Jesus from the clear prophecies and from what he did, well, now we, it's fair, I think, to use the cloak prophecies to say, look, and he even matches the stuff that was cloaked. So that's, I think, a fair use of prophecy. And I distinguish between those two in that one part of the fuse. And also, I think, I, I don't know if anyone else has done that before. Maybe they have. I just wasn't aware of it. But I don't list the prophecies by types, you know, like, oh, here's prophecies about the, ex- the crucifixion. Here are prophecies about where he'll be born. Here are prophecies about what kind of ministry he will do. No, I want to list them chronic- uh, uh, chronologically. Like, when did they occur? Because if you ever wonder, like, why does Jesus arrive when he arrives? Part of the answer to that question comes down to those six investigative questions we asked. The what, when, why, how, where, right? That tells you who the who is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out you don't get clear answers in those first five questions to identify the who until you get to about Malachi. And it's the prophecies in their order that start to unwrap more. If Jesus shows up earlier in history, the prophecies are not yet specific enough, especially pre-Isaiah. They're not specific enough. Daniel actually starts to give you a time frame, but we're coming in later in history. And then you start to get enough information that now I can make a case from prophecy that I couldn't have made a thousand years earlier. There wasn't enough prophecy available to make a case. And that's what's interesting is to see it in its chronology. And I put that in a timeline so you can see why and when those questions get answered in the timeline, leaving the last open question, the who question. Mm-hmm. And of course, the who question is always going to be derivative from all the other questions. It's like, hey, who is your suspect? Well, I'm still have to investigate the what, when, why, how, where's. And when I get those, I'll know who the who is. Mm-hmm. The same thing happens with prophecies. Yeah. Wow. Uh, hey, if you're watching this right now, you're getting some value, hit that like button and do subscribe to the show so that you won't miss any more of uh, our interviews. Well, you know, I'm thinking about now what you're making me think about is the earliest prophecy or rather the earliest uh, Jewish apologetic for Jesus as Lord and Messiah in Acts 2. And mm-hmm. one of the things that Peter alludes to is Psalm 110, which Jesus alluded to at his Jewish examination, which he talked about earlier. And even though that prophecy had its um, context when it was first written, the, the interpretation had evolved up until now Christians are using this and looking in hindsight going, oh, wow, right. Jesus, uh, he was vindicated. Everything that, that he said was vindicated when God raised him from the dead. He's at the right hand of God now. He's pouring out the Holy Spirit. And that is the first Jewish apologetic for Jesus as Lord and Messiah. So I love right. that. He's using a piece of cloak, uh, well, mm-hmm. depending on how you look at it. And I've tried to separate those out for you. You know, one of the things we did, we realized that, like you said, I wanted to write something that's accessible. That's mm-hmm. always my biggest concern. I'm a translator, right? So we can, we can, we can study and go toe to toe on some of the data and some of the evidence, right? But in mm-hmm. the end, when you do a 10 week trial in front of a jury, I'll spend 10 weeks to, uh, going through the evidence with the jury, but that closing argument will not be another 10 weeks. The closing argument will be a few hours summarizing 10 weeks of work we've already done together. So I write books that are closing arguments, right? I mean, there's a lot of data, but in the end, I want to write that three hour closing argument because I'm trying to uh, move people to action. And, and so what I try to do in this book is to provide you though with the 10 weeks. So we have more case notes for this book than there are words in the book. Mm -hmm. So in the actual printed version of the book, we have about 50 pages of case notes and notes. Um, But you'll see about starting about chapter five uh, in the case notes, we link out to a PDF file, which is available online. That is another 279 pages of notes. And so that's far more than the actual length of the book. But what we wanted to do is if you're wondering, like, which which of these prophecies do I consider clear or cloaked? Well, that's in the case notes. I wanted to give you that mm-hmm. list. What, what mm-hmm. prophecies am I even considering at all? That's in my case notes. Yeah. And so I wanted to give you enough data and detail in the case notes that would allow people if they wanted to. De- now, some, of pe- some people will never. I mean, some people are like, I'm a consumer of case notes, uh, but not everyone is. So I wanted to write a book that was accessible. There's over 400 illustrations in the book that really kind of make it move fast. I mean, when we recorded the audio version, it records really quick. Like it took me three days to record a cold Mm -hmm. case, took me two to record person of interest. It's that visual. Mm 
But the point I'm trying to make is I wanted to provide you with the data. So that is in the book for sure. Yeah. But now, Jim, let's turn to how we can have conversations with our skeptical friends about Jesus' impact on society, because sometimes right. people who aren't uh, comfortable just starting with the Bible, well, just to show them the impact, the yeah. massive impact. Uh, influence that Jesus has had uh, would cause people to say, well, who is Jesus really? Um, sure. So let's let's talk about some of these areas. And I think one of the, the most unique things about your book is where you talk about music. Um, I don't know anyone who's done that. Um, how has Jesus impacted music back from early church music, even to popular music? Yeah, so much of this, you know, it's, this is the problem with writing a visual book is that I could I could talk about this, but when you see the case visually, you go, oh, I get it, right? So a lot of people will tell me that you're just kind of reading from image to image to image, just like a graphic novel. But but what, what I, I was amazed by is all the things that I would have said as an atheist that were most valuable to me as an artist or as somebody who was in the arts, right? I mean, I played in a lot of, a lot of bands growing up. Uh, when I first became a Christian, I played in a lot of worship teams. And uh, a lot of it for me, would have been, I would have said the most important aspects of life for anyone are art, music, literature. Um, I would always probably snuck in architecture, but just take that out for a second. Uh, for sure, mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. For sure, science. Mm -hmm. I was raised in the 60s and 70s when science was king, right? Star Trek, first generation. That was, mm -hmm. you know, that was what we all thought that we would not only be on the moon, we thought we'd probably be on Mars before you know it. Um, so I always thought that science was, was, was premier. Um, so those are the five things that I would have said. Well, it turns out those five things are so deeply indebted to the worldview inaugurated by Jesus in the first century that we would not have what we presently think of in those five categories, if not for Jesus. He's not just uh, a, a player. He's instrumental in the development mm -hmm. of those five aspects of culture. And every single person who's succeeded in those areas at some point will hat tip Jesus or will be inspired by Jesus. Yeah. And from those five areas of culture, you can completely reconstruct the story of, of Jesus, even if every New Testament document was destroyed. Hmm. So if you just look at music in the first three centuries of the common era and look at the hymns sung by Christians, we still have them. They still survive. They're still sung in many uh, certain denominations of churches. Mm -hmm. uh, but those hymns, and I think I've recorded several hundred in the book, in the case notes, from those hymns, you can completely reconstruct the story of Jesus. Because not only that, you can reconstruct the theology of Christianity as sung in the hymns. The hymns provide us with data. So that if you destroy, you have to destroy all the hymns, too, because the history of church hymns is pretty robust. You would not be able to destroy the Jesus story by simply hunting down the New Testaments. Mm -hmm. Because it turns out that songs, music, I mean, by the way, the entire history and development of music was shaped by Jesus and his followers. If you're, if you're using musical notation, you can thank a Jesus follower. If you're singing in minor or major chords, you can mm -hmm. thank a Jesus follower. If you're somebody who loves harmonies and how harmonies are used in music and how they're structured within those major and minor chords, well, you can thank Christians for mm -hmm. that, too. If you're somebody who, who is inspired by even any music in the last hundred years, I went through and looked at every top 100 artists, recording artists in every genre, in every category, if it's hip hop, if whatever it is. And I looked at the catalogs of every one of those artists. There's about 150 given three databases, IMDb, Billboard, Rolling Stone, about three, about 150 of these, all but two have sung a song about Jesus. Hmm. That cannot be said of any other character in history no wow. it cannot be said yeah but it does it is said of jesus that is true and, and this is what's interesting about it is whatever you're listening to in your earbuds uh whatever form of music there's a there's a it's 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 standing upon both the instruments the instrumentation the the methodology that the theory the music theory that was so deeply shaped by jesus followers within the yes. context of the church within the context of certain kingdoms within the concept of the monarchies in which those things were, were raised that that you are indebted in a way you probably don't even know mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. so that's what's so amazing about jesus is that not only did his followers shape music because he because we come out of a uniquely musical worldview mm -hmm. remember that david's writing psalms we think that one of those psalms jesus is singing at the lord's supper right at the, at the last supper he is singing one of those they sing a hymn before they go out into the garden and paul tells us to continue singing hymns and spiritual songs where else in the world mm -hmm. on a weekly basis does somebody get up every every week 
stand on a stage and sing to an audience. That's happening in churches. Mm -hmm. And that's why so many of the people who shape the history of music have come out of that tradition because mm -hmm. it's a singing tradition. Yeah. yeah it really is. And again, to think that this guy, this nobody amongst, of, if you compare him to all the other Jewish sages of the first century, he didn't have the stature of many other Jewish sages of that period. Yet he's the one who shapes not only music, but art, education, science, literature. It's just, it's striking. And I think that it's either just this unbelievably fortunate set of uh, circumstances, or there's something more at stake here. There's something bigger happening mm -hmm. than just he got lucky. Mm -hmm. You know, you could probably make an argument that there are more people playing in worship bands today than there are gigging musicians on any, you know, a day over the week. Um, That's right. The the guitar industry is is super indebted to churches right oh, now yeah, just for I, being yeah, alive. I, I bet you, I'd love to have like a survey done at Guitar Center to see how many people are purchasing from church settings who are regular purchasers, right? Because those folks are just yeah. regular people like you and me who have jobs, who can afford guitars, and we're actually in Guitar Center buying guitars. I used to, I, I talked to somebody one time, he says, yeah, you know, it's not musicians that are struggling, they're our bread and butter. It's folks like you who are playing in churches who have money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I thought, That's so fascinating, right? So there's a number of reasons why we've had the deep impact we've had on, in music. And, and I think, again, the fact that we can reconstruct the story. Yeah from music is powerful because that means you have to destroy the history of music also in addition to the new testament documents that's amazing yeah i used to play in bands too in my younger years and uh one of my guitar heroes is slash from guns and roses and yeah. uh to hear him play in the harmonic minor and you figure out where the harmonic minor is you know being used in early church music oh my gosh yes. That's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, it really is. And again, it's because we are coming. That's not because we're like, oh, we're like these brilliant musical minds compared to the rest of the non-brilliant unmusical world. It's just that we have a tradition that calls us to sing. And when that happens, it creates a robust culture of singing and music. And then you start to add, you know, a lot in the beginning, the, the first songs were entirely a cappella. The adding of instruments occurs over history. And, and so you'll see that, but of course, this is why we are uniquely um, um, musical worldview from start to finish. Mm -hmm. You know, I did see a statistic about the Guitar Center thing. I just don't want to say it right now because I don't want to misquote it, but I will find that uh, piece of evidence and then put it in the description. Um, yeah, last... and mine is entirely anecdotal. Okay, mine is just right <laughs> here locally when I was in there, uh, you know, I, you know I'm, and I'm looking for all the pedals and things that I was a bass player. And so I was just kind yeah. of increasing my, you know, my my repertoire, increasing my catalog, my uh, equipment. And I remember talking to him and saying, who, 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 who comes in? Who are all these other people I'm standing around? And he was just telling me. I thought that was really fat. He was not a Christian guy. But yeah. he, he recognized that that was most of his, his uh, clientele. Well, how would you just give someone a short answer to this question on the cover of your book? Why does Jesus still matter in a world that rejects the Bible? So, again, it comes back to this thing we just talked about, and I think it's very important. Ask yourself what matters. And then ask yourself, how did we get here in those areas that still matter to me? And you'll probably find that you're in a, steeped in a world that has been so deeply touched by Jesus, the worldview he inaugurated, and the people who followed him and enacted that worldview, that the things you value that you never even know, knew were indebted to Jesus are indebted mm -hmm. to Jesus. Mm -hmm. if, if you're indebted to a certain kind of, of traditional relationship even, you're probably standing on the Western tradition related to the descriptions of what relationships ought to be in the New Testament. But more importantly, if you have any of those five areas, there's actually six, because I've included also non-Christian theistic worldviews. So if you said, well, spirituality is important to me. Well, I'll tell you what, do you realize that pretty much every theistic worldview hat tips Jesus? They've included Jesus in their worldview in some way. Mm -hmm. Either they're in the, on the pages of their scripture, he's there on the pages, or the leaders of that worldview have now tried to merge Jesus into their worldview. Yeah. If you consider yourself to be just a mildly spiritual person and you identify with some form of Buddhism or Hinduism or whatever it may be, well, mm -hmm. guess what? Jesus is already there waiting for you. Because he's already been included by the leaders of these groups who see him as part of at least a fitting in to the teaching of their worldview. So, so if it's not that, if it's science, well, you know what? 
a scientist by and large, historically, all the major sciences were founded and fathered by Christ followers. i sorry, it's just true. Most winners, historically, of all scientific awards. Uh, Christians account for more than any other groups, all the other groups combined, hmm. um, even the Nobel Prize. Um, okay, if, if you think it's education, well, you realize that modern universities are were founded by Christ followers. The first three in Bologna, Paris, and Oxford were founded by Christians. I mean, do you realize that every modern, the top 15 universities in the world today were all founded by Christians? Yeah. That's not a yeah. Christian listing. That's the secular listing. Mm -hmm. If you think the arts have not been impacted, but no one's inspired more art than Jesus. No one's inspired more music than Jesus. No one's inspired more literature than Jesus. Whatever area you think is it matters to you today, mm -hmm. it turns out you can thank probably the history of Christianity for getting us where we got to be so that you got to have that interest. Yeah. That's why he is history's most important person of interest, because whatever interests you is probably indebted to him. Mm -hmm. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, I love how Craig Hazen says, why not start your investigation with the religion that has Jesus right in the center, which is Christianity. That's right. And I think one thing that's come out of our discussion here today is that Jesus is someone who is worth investigating, um, even if someone isn't comfortable maybe starting with the Bible, just the sheer weight and the magnitude of Jesus' impact on the world could open the door to the question, who is Jesus really? That's my favorite question in the whole world. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's something that should drive us to examine the Gospels and how they portray Jesus, who is the ultimate person of interest. Well, thank you, Jim, so much for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me. You know, I, 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 we, we've been watching each other's work for years, and I'm just so glad we're partnered in the gospel together. Oh, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. And I want to thank you as well for joining us. If you found this helpful, please do hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. And hey, let me know in the comments, what is the number one question you get asked about Jesus? Your question might get answered in a future video. I'm your apologetics guy, Mikkel. And until next time, keep the faith.